something's not right about 3i slash Atlas. In late July, flagship space telescopes like Hubble and JWST captured extraordinary data on this rare interstellar comet. Then, just as its coma ballooned past 300,000 kilometers and reports emerged of a green tinge and strange brightening, the official updates went silent. NASA blamed solar geometry and safety rules, but the abrupt lull stands out when Oumuamua and Borisov sparked flurries of rapid-fire releases. This information vacuum isn't just fueling wild theories. Missing timely answers could undermine public trust in how astronomical discoveries are revealed. So what's the real reason for the blackout, and what are we not being told about 3i slash Atlas? On July 21, 2025, the Hubble Space Telescope locked onto 3i slash Atlas and captured the sharpest images yet of this interstellar visitor. Two and a half weeks later, on August 7, those images went public, showing a nucleus no larger than 5.6 kilometers across and a sprawling dust plume stretching sunward. By August 6, the James Webb Space Telescope had taken its turn, using the NIAR spec instrument to gather spectra. But for Webb, only technical notes and preliminary comments reached the public, no headline images, just hints that analysis was underway. Gemini South joined in on August 27, capturing images that confirmed the comet's activity and tail evolution. Those data appeared in the public archive by September 4 and 5th giving researchers and amateur astronomers another look at the growing coma and shifting dust features. Each release landed with a burst of online discussion, but the intervals between them started to widen. After September 22nd, the cadence changed. No new flagship images, no fresh datasets from Hubble, JWST, or Gemini. The flow of official updates slowed to a crawl. For anyone tracking the comet's progress, the absence was impossible to miss. The public timeline, once marked by steady releases, now showed a growing gap. The question wasn't just about what had been seen, but why nothing more was coming. Observing 3i slash Atlas with Hubble or JWST isn't just a matter of pointing and shooting. Both telescopes are governed by strict solar avoidance rules, technical boundaries set to protect their sensitive optics and detectors from stray sunlight. For Hubble, the rule is clear. No observations within 50 degrees of the sun. JWST, with its massive sunshield and delicate infrared sensors, is even stricter, enforcing an 85-degree minimum separation. These angles aren't negotiable, they're baked into the system. If a target drifts too close to the sun's position in the sky, the software locks out any attempt to schedule or execute an observation. The risk isn't just theoretical. Direct sunlight could overheat the instruments, permanently damage detectors, or even threaten the entire mission. As 3. I slash Atlas moved along its path, its solar elongation, the angle between the comet, Earth, and the sun, shrunk day by day. By late August, it slipped past Hubble's 50-degree limit, and just after JWST's August 6th NIR spec run, the comet crossed JWST's 85-degree threshold. At that point, both telescopes entered an enforced blackout. The science teams at the Space Telescope Science Institute, who manage scheduling and operations, had no choice but to stand down. The keep-out zones are hardwired into the mission planning tools. Attempts to override them would trigger automatic safing protocols and could halt all science operations until a full review. This isn't about bureaucratic caution, these are hard physical limits. Even urgent target of opportunity requests can't bypass the keep out zones. The only option is to wait for the geometry to change. For three, I slash Atlas, that means no new flagship images or spectra until the comet's elongation increases again, which orbital calculations predict will happen in early December. Until then, the blackout holds and the flagship observatories remain silent, not by choice, but by design. Hints about 3i slash Atlas's true nature began to surface as soon as the first science data trickled out. Hubble's July images revealed not just a dust tail, but a sprawling coma, an envelope of gas and dust, stretching nearly 348,000 kilometers across. That's more than a quarter of the Sun's diameter and far larger than most comets at this distance. 
The most intriguing detail came from early spectroscopic notes. Astronomers started whispering about an unusually strong carbon dioxide signal in the coma. Now, it's important to say that, as of late September, no one has published a peer-reviewed quantitative spectrum confirming carbon dioxide dominance. But the hints are there, and the science teams haven't denied it. For a comet entering the inner solar system for the first time, that would be a major chemical clue. Most local comets are water-dominated at this range. Alongside the official releases, amateur astronomers kept pace with their own observations. Several reported seeing a distinct greenish tint in the coma, likely from dicarbon or cyanogen, classic signatures in cometary chemistry, but with a twist. Some observers noted the green was brighter and more persistent than in typical comets, though without full spectral data, it's hard to pin down the cause. The sunward plume, first caught by Hubble and then Gemini, also became a talking point. Its shape and brightness seemed to shift from night to night, sparking debate about whether surface outbursts or viewing geometry were to blame. Photometry, measuring the comet's brightness, added another layer of confusion. Amateur and professional measurements scattered widely, sometimes differing by more than a full magnitude. Some of that is down to equipment and calibration, but part of it may reflect real, rapid changes in the coma or nucleus. With flagship observatories offline, the scatter in these ground-based reports became the main window into 3i slash Atlas's activity. For now, the best available facts point to a comet with an outsized coma, a possible carbon dioxide-rich composition, a sunward plume, and a color profile that refuses to settle. In the absence of new flagship data, each oddity becomes a seed for speculation and a reminder of just how much we're relying on the trickle of amateur and ground-based science. By late September, the silence around 3i slash Atlas wasn't just technical, it started to feel personal for the people watching from the ground. Social media threads filled with frustration and speculation. One amateur astronomer wrote, It's like chasing a ghost. Every night we're guessing what's actually happening out there. Another asked, Why can't we just see the raw data? What are they waiting for? The truth is, the pipeline from telescope to public release is anything but instant. Every observation from Hubble or JWST enters a kind of limbo. Once the data are downlinked, they go through calibration, removal of cosmic rays, correction for detector quirks, and background subtraction. For JWST, the process is even more involved. Each NIR spec spectrum passes through multiple software stages, with instrument teams checking for artifacts or calibration errors. A single missed step can mean claiming a chemical signature that isn't real. Beyond the technical hurdles, there's policy. Both Hubble and JWST operate under proprietary periods, six months for most Hubble programs, up to a year for JWST. The principal investigators, or PIS, get first crack at the data, a tradition meant to reward those who designed and won the observing proposals. While some PIS choose to release data early, many wait until their teams have analyzed and cross-checked every pixel. That's especially true for targets as high-profile as 3i slash Atlas, where a premature claim could ripple through the scientific community and the press. Institutional routines add more layers. Every press release or headline image passes through multiple agencies, NASA, ESA, and sometimes CSA for JWST. Each group reviews the findings, checks for legal and contractual issues, and coordinates on timing. Even a non-controversial dataset can sit for weeks in this review loop, waiting for sign-off from project scientists and communications leads. For 3i slash Atlas, the process slowed further as teams weighed the risks of releasing incomplete or ambiguous results. As one JWST co-investigator put it, it's better to be right late than wrong fast. With interstellar targets, there's no second chance. All this means that while the public and citizen scientists are hungry for updates, the official channels move at their own pace. The sense of waiting, of staring at the same old images while rumors swirl, is built into the system. For many in the community, the vacuum feels like a wall. For the mission schedulers and data analysts, it's a wall built for caution, not secrecy. But the longer the silence stretches, the more it shapes the conversation. 
turning procedural delays into fuel for speculation and routine caution into a source of unease. Rumors about 3 con i atlas started multiplying as soon as the flagship telescopes went silent. Some threads pinned the blackout on classified sensors, suggesting that military or intelligence satellites had snapped images the public would never see. Others leaned into panic prevention, the idea that agencies were managing the story, holding back data to avoid alarming headlines about an interstellar anomaly. There is even a camp that claims the data are simply too strange to release quickly, that scientists are scrambling behind the scenes to make sense of something that does not fit the usual playbook. The media landscape only adds fuel. Stories about comets like Lemon or Swan, bright, easy to spot, and photogenic, climb social media charts and headline lists. Their visibility makes them algorithm gold. What you can see tonight always wins clicks. In contrast, 3i slash Atlas, with its patchy updates and technical hurdles, fades from the trending list. When there is nothing new to show, the vacuum fills with speculation. After the Gemini South images dropped in early September, social media engagement for 3.1i slash Atlas spiked to levels 10 times higher than typical comets, then drifted toward conspiracy hashtags as the data gap stretched on. But the reality behind the scenes is less dramatic and far more methodical. Every observation from Hubble or JWST enters a multi-stage pipeline before anyone outside the instrument team gets a look. First, the raw data are downlinked and tagged with spacecraft telemetry. Then, calibration routines kick in. Cosmic rays are scrubbed, detector quirks corrected, backgrounds subtracted. For JWST, this means passing through at least three main stages, detector level corrections, instrument calibration, and advanced processing like co-addition and artifact rejection. Each stage is checked for errors, flagged for anomalies, and sometimes rerun if anything looks off. Once the data reach a science-ready state, the principal investigators review them, often under a proprietary period, six months for Hubble, up to a year for JWST. Only after the PI and team are confident in the results do they move to the next gate, agency review. NA, SA, ESA, and sometimes CSA all weigh in, checking for legal, contractual, and scientific issues. Press offices coordinate the timing of releases, sometimes waiting weeks for everyone to sign off. If the data are ambiguous or hint at something unexpected, the process slows even further. A premature claim, especially for a high-profile target like 3i slash Atlas, risks a public correction or even a retraction. The contrast with earlier interstellar visitors is sharp. When Oumuamua was discovered in 2017, the data poured out almost in real time. Preprints, open debate, and wild speculation all hit the internet within days. Borisov, two years later, followed a steady textbook cadence. Images and spectra released on schedule with little drama. For 3i slash Atlas, the combination of technical hurdles, cautious review, and multi-agency sign-off has created a slow, uneven flow. The result is a perfect storm for rumor and frustration. But beneath the noise, the pipeline is grinding forward, stage by stage, each step designed to catch mistakes before they reach the public. For the engineers and analysts inside the process, it is not about secrecy or story control, it is about getting the science right even if that means waiting longer than anyone would like. The Mars flyby on October the 3rd is the next big opportunity for new data on 3 ton i slash Atlas. At its closest, the comet will pass just 0.19 astronomical units from Mars, about 28 million kilometers. That's close in cosmic terms, but still far beyond the reach of any high-resolution imaging. The ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, or TGO, carries the Cassis camera, which is often cited for its sharp 5 meter per pixel images of the Martian surface. But at this distance, Cassis faces hard physical limits. The best case scenario, each pixel covers more than 300 kilometers. The nucleus of 3 quant i slash Atlas, somewhere between 320 meters and 5.6 kilometers across, will be a single unresolved dot. No detail, no shape, just a faint point of light against the background stars. High Rise on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, with its larger aperture, can do a bit better, 
down to about 34 kilometers per pixel, but that's still orders of magnitude too coarse to pick out the nucleus or any structure in the coma or tail. These cameras were built for mapping Mars at close range, not for deep space targets moving across the sky. Tracking a comet at interplanetary speeds isn't in their playbook. Exposure times have to be short to avoid smearing, and the signal-to-noise drops fast as the comet fades into the distance. So what can Mars orbiters actually deliver? Photometry, a measurement of the comet's brightness at a moment when Earth-based telescopes and the flagship observatories are sidelined by solar geometry. A point source detection from Mars orbit is valuable for tracking the comet's position and activity, especially if there's any sudden outburst or brightness change during the flyby. The data pipeline is fast. TGO and Mars Express can downlink and process these observations within a day or two, barring any technical hiccups. But for anyone expecting a dramatic close-up, it's important to set expectations now. The Mars flyby is about timing, not detail. The real value lies in coverage during a window when every other eye is forced to look away. Perihelion for 3 I slash Atlas arrives on October 29th or 30th, with the comet passing about 1.36 astronomical units from the Sun. At that distance, it's not a classic sun grazer, but the rapid heating and high velocity still put the nucleus under real stress. So, what should you watch for as the comet swings through solar passage and re-emerges in December? First, keep an eye on the light curve. Sudden jumps in brightness, especially sharp, short-lived spikes, can signal surface fragmentation or outbursts. But a smooth rise and fall, following the expected curve as the comet nears and then recedes from the sun, points to steady volatile release rather than breakup. Remember, a single brightness jump isn't proof of fragmentation. You want to see a pattern, ideally confirmed by multiple observers. Next, look for changes in the anti-tail, the sunward pointing spike seen in wide field images. As Earth's position shifts relative to the comet's orbital plane, the anti-tail can flip or fade. For 3 i slash Atlas, anti-tail prominence should peak close to perihelion, then rapidly diminish as the geometry changes into December. Tracking its orientation across images is a powerful tool for confirming orbital details and dust behavior. Color matters too. If the greenish hue reported by amateurs disappears or shifts after perihelion, that could mean the loss of certain molecules as surface ices are depleted or fresh material is exposed. But only spectra can confirm what's really changing. Images alone can mislead. In December, as the comet's elongation increases and flagship telescopes regain access, expect a new wave of high-resolution imaging and spectroscopy. And looking ahead to 2026, a favorable Jupiter geometry could offer another window for study, if 3 quarti i slash atlas survives its solar encounter. For now, the best toolkit is a critical eye. Compare images across dates, cross-check photometry, question dramatic reports, and remember that color isn't chemistry without spectra. The global community, from professionals to backyard observers, is watching together. The story isn't over. It's just about to turn another page. Official documents point to technical constraints. Hubble's 50-degree and JWST's 85-degree solar avoidance angles, plus multi-week data pipelines and strict proprietary holds. Despite these explanations, the absence of real-time updates on an interstellar object with a carbon dioxide dominant coma, sunward plume, and reports of a green tint has left major scientific questions open. No peer-reviewed spectra confirming the coma's chemistry are public, and the full implications of the brightness scatter remain unaddressed. As Mars orbiters prepare for a close pass at 0.19 astronomical units, the next images and spectra, subject to 24 to 48 hour downlinks, could finally break the information bottleneck. Until then, the 3i slash Atlas case shows how institutional caution and technical limitations can shape what the world sees and does not see about the rarest visitors to our solar system.